And we're back. We are back. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Ask Arena Live after show. It is episode eight. And we are coming back to you with a very normal topic, but we want to make it fun. We're going to do the best we can. We're going to do so what we can. We're going to do the best you know, we after can. After a of debauchery. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna, I'm sure it it'll lead us down some sort of road to debauchery, so don't fret if you've gotten accustomed to that. That's what the after show is for. Yeah, this is what, what the after show is for. So, thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching. I'm Janine Truitt, Chief Innovations Officer for Talent Think Innovations LLC, based here in New York. And I focus on workforce planning, digital transformation projects, tech advisory, just to name a few things. If you're ever interested in what I do at scale, you can visit me at www.talentthinkinnovations.com. I'm going to pass it to my dear buddy, Sarah. Hello, everyone. I am Sarah Morgan. The Buzz on HR is where you can find me on all social media platforms. I'm Chief Excellence Officer of Buzz Rooney LLC. We are a HR leadership and management consulting and coaching organization. I say we, like like I said, from speaking, speaking things. Yeah, you got to manifest this. Me. You got to just say that because it, 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 it the me and we. <laughs> it would be. It's the me love, and we. Love it. So I, I feel I, there's there's a little sadness I have because the good doc's not here. The good like, doc is forward missing to in the action. Clowning and the outfit and you know yeah. the things that come with the doc but we're gonna keep it pushing because i'm sure that there's a good reason why he's not with this yeah so yeah human performance so the i wanted to um shout out the track star once again yes tonight's really show. awesome oh. that track star is wanting to sponsor we love sponsors we love when shows are you know paid and we're not just out here like suffering creatives <laughs> right Back. so what are your thoughts on performance i mean you're <sighs> in the thick of it still i am i am still in the thick of it and the the best thing i think we ever did was to go from performance evaluations into a performance management system out of paper forms into real like real a real performance management system where managers are able to set goals and milestones and have you know give feedback and employees are able to give feedback about you know how they're progressing challenges they may be having and all of that then feeds into and we still have an annual review but all of that information the goals that get set the projects that are assigned that all feeds into uh, the annual evaluation and then they're able to look at what they have accomplished in the course of a year alongside the competencies and a total evaluation of performance. But for us, we set goals on the quarter. So, and that's fairly, we have some, it depends on the department, we have some departments that set goals monthly which are really more um, sales and production driven, but those employees know somewhere between the first and fifth of month, you know, what their targets are and what they're being measured against that gets published and added to the performance management system. Um, the rest of us are in administrative positions and corporate support positions are getting, um, are doing that on a quarterly basis. And then for my team, we're having conversations every single week about the projects that you're working on, the goals that you set, and how you are progressing towards that. I don't, I just can't find another way to manage performance. I can remember being in an environment where I was getting the annual performance review and miserable. It was a miserable, useless exercise. I literally did not see my manager until it was time for me to, until something was wrong because he didn't work in the same office as me, worked out of state. So unless something was wrong or it was time for my performance review and then he would come, my performance review would be, you know, meets expectations mm -hmm. 
on across the board. It didn't matter what I did. I could do, you know, backflips off the bills and I'm just meeting expectations and here's your couple, two, three coins right. and I'm out. <laughs> See you next year. And who wants to, who's trying to live that life? Nobody's coming to work every day for 12 months to have their boss, you know, ascend from the heavens once a year, tell right. them that they are a three and then float back off, not to be seen again for another 12 months like that kind of evaluation what are you evaluating like I don't even know how you feel comfortable using that word so I think I I love what you talked about there's so much room for us to do that better the idea that we don't have to evaluate performance that's the thing that's to make me uncomfortable because yes we do you have a responsibility when you manage people to tell them how they're doing and whether that's good or bad or whatever, but you have a responsibility to do that. That's never going away. Um, so, but the way that it gets handled definitely can shift. And I think the, we're, the fact that we're starting to see more and more technology that's in support of that, I think is great. Um, and anything that's going to, you know, I, I weep of the poor human resources people out there and the poor managers out there still filling out forms oh and circle circle in boxes like you um take the, what would they call when we were in school the the, the pat form the, with the little <laughs> bubble yeah good lord ah. jesus i took it all the way back oh to my the god Ugh. all the way back yeah, like you, yeah. you know, like you, like the little green form with the yes. bubbles on it. If, yes. Like, oh my god. Mm-mm. Scantron. No, we can't. Scantron <laughs> card it just evaluation is. in 2019. Who, who, who authorized this? Oh like, I feel, but there are, there are people. And to your point, it's like, well, it's working. So if it's not broke, you know, let's not fix it. Um, that's the, but then, but then you got posters on the wall talk about we end up <laughs> this part. But you got, <laughs> but you got, but you got scared from yeah. performance evaluation. Ain't nothing innovative about that. So we can't be afraid as human resources professionals to be creative and to, because the other thing that happens is it takes the excuse away when the process is convoluted then you have that issue of managers not wanting to participate when the pro you know oh it's this manual process i got 15 people that report to me i gotta fill out a scantron for every single one of these like all these bubbles and a number two pencil like i can't you know i can't even find a sharpener like it turns that turns in pencil either no no mm -mm, no you got to have the good quality i don't know what a good brand of pencil is but you got to have a good good staples number two you know sharp (laughs) and they'd be like right and they'd be like oh i don't have the right pencil for that you know so i I can't do it and you're you're beating your head against the wall when you when we rolled out our performance management system there was no more excuses as to there should never be a situation where somebody doesn't know how they're doing. You can't say that you don't have the tools available you. It is to you. It's literally clicking. And I love when the systems are so like gamified. Now I haven't seen Trackstar in action, but I've heard about them before. And I love, you know, it becomes gamified. Everything is is drop down, real user friendly. And that when that happens, now what's now what's the problem? Now why you can't tell people right. what's going on with them? So that you got to remove those excuses and those, you know, those barriers. Um, but when we have a, a process that the managers hate it, the employee hates it, HR hates it from an administrative standpoint, but let's just keep doing it the way that we've been doing it. The sound, you know, sounds legit, but that sounds like a winner. No, it's not. No, it's not. Not, not in the least. So, I mean, I love stepping back from the HR aspect of it, right? Cause we both do HR. I'm gonna put on a little mm-hmm. bit of a conspiracy theorist hat. So I heard Gary Hamel, 
um, who he's like a professor at the London Business School last year at Unleash. And his whole talk was on how work has gotten infantilized. And, and yes, basically- I remember that. Right. And so his whole discussion was around how all of these processes we do, performance evaluations and all that stuff is basically businesses, um, it, it's how they control people. It's how they, you know, they, they exert power. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that? And before I even get to that, oh. hello, Pablo. Hey, Pablo. It's nice that you joined to us. the show. Well, Thank you. I appreciate it. You late so in. You oh, late and muted. But you, he comes you in here with, with, the, with the Adolf Hitler the fade, mustache and going the, on. And your Hitler and, stash. And then we out here. Change it up. <laughs> your inglorious bastard stash. Change it up. He got some money. Oh he got some money, so he got oh a haircut. My. Somebody must have paid your ass. You're looking clean. Nah, chill, chill. Client, clients so. paying their invoices is the right. first of the Word. month. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. <laughs> Some people know I talk to y'all, man. What? Why are I on here? We got to clown you. You were you're tardy yeah. to the party. No, nah, I was. I was. Party. That's my You've bad. Been... I For the viewers who don't know, we have our own little um our own little side chat. He's been talking mad trash in the side chat. So <laughs> you knew we, we came prepared. We like, came prepared. I know. Tonight. I know. Like I was a like good man, antagonizing always. Sagittarius. Always. You said always. what? Always. Always heckling. Always heckling. Listen, I'm I'm just trying to trying to be a different voice, a different perspective. That's all. And we appreciate it. <sighs> You want to introduce yourself before we have a yeah, before we can get because before we dive any deeper, let's tell people who. Oh my you goodness! Are. Yes, I am Dr. Paul McNeil. I am the founder of MB Usable Security, and we focus on uh, using your data to help make you more revenue and protect your data at the same time. What? what? Come on! Big come time. You know, we're out here. We're here, trying a little bit. Come through with the elevator. Oh, flex. Oh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so and we're talking about Gary Hamel, who I love, love, love this man now that I've, I've seen him and met him because I'm always looking for ways to abolish the system in my head. So, you know, his whole thing is... Basically, work is infantilized. There's absolutely, in his opinion, there's absolutely no reason why we should be controlling any one human being that comes to work for us, right? They should be able to come. They should be able to work. I agree. Um, and, yeah, I agree. you know, he, he basically asked, you know, some things of us, like, you know, why aren't people choosing the jobs that they want within the company and, you know, doing the stuff that moves them? Why don't people um, approve their own expenses? Like he really believes that a lot of what we do and a lot of the people we put in place to do these jobs could be eliminated if we just treat adults like adults. Okay. Um, and that mm -hmm. we're not doing that means that businesses still feel like they have a need to, control and to have power over people what do you guys think yeah i so i don't know if i go as far as he does but in general i do feel like we we still are in a very command and control mindset when it comes to how we manage people most of the leadership and business theory that we still follow today like the core leadership and business theories were written during the industrial time Mm -hmm. We don't we don't look like that no more, particularly like in, in the United States. We're very service driven. And so um, that mentality and the things that go along with that from a command and control perspective don't work with the modern workplace. But yet that is what is ingrained in people down to, you know, the textbooks and the people that we recommend that folks read oh you got to read this book you got to read that book and they're telling you to manage in ways and monitor people in ways that do not apply to modern time so
created content, like you have to have a rule for everything. Like, what is the rule? Do I have to give a rule for how my bath only finish that out? I mean, so how do you frozen. Have a rule for everything else? I'm, am I back? No. Yeah, you're back. Yeah, you're back. I'm back. Where did I leave off? Where did I freeze up at? It just sounded so profound, but it was coming in like e u i e i e o p orc. Right. I was on the Genesis. I was on my Genesis. E pop orc. Orc. I love you. Oh my god. E pop orc. Yo, you. Yo, you took that back. We had scan tribe cards. Now we on the e pop orc. Oh my god. Oh my god. That's my favorite. I love it. I love it. Eat up work. Eat up work. So, but yeah, I just, I think, you know, we, people want rules for everything. We yeah. want to control everything. We, we just, we do too much and we don't allow people, you give people guidelines, you give people guardrails, you tell them you work between this space and this space and then you let people figure out the best way to do that. Um, and then you coach them. And if they're not, you know, and as long as they're not doing anything, as long as they're meeting deadlines, getting done the work that they need to get done, leave people alone. Like, leave, just, just leave people alone. And I think that's the direction. That's why you see so many people coming out of corporate America either wanting to start businesses for themselves or being like, fuck this, I'm going to go drive for Lyft because I can take back control over my time. Mm -hmm. And... So the more, you know, flexibility that you're able to give people, the better off I think, you know, the world of work will be. So I don't know if I am the, the camp that's like, you know, we don't need no administrative support. Everybody should be able to approve their own stuff. If somebody got to watch, in particular with, with financial transactions, somebody got to watch the bag. Blockchain. Somebody got to... Yeah, somebody got to be that, feel what's uh, You know what I mean? On. Like when that hit yeah. hard. That, blockchain, oh man, blockchain would, now blockchain would do that. Blockchain would eliminate that because if you have a, a blockchain, you can't buy. Right. Unless but the blockchain will say, oh, you're not authorized to buy this with this type of money. You can't do it. The blockchain would, would stop all that shit. Right. But yeah. no, but until that comes the thing people become the barrier somebody's got to be you know taking a look at that to figure out and um but i also think the watchers sometimes go a little bit overboard it's like you want to catch somebody slipping you want to find a reason to not prove the thing and to be like nope you didn't cross this t you didn't dot this i um i can't read this receipt and then suddenly, you know, like, it's like you try to find reasons to make the situation difficult for somebody. And I, I don't tolerate that when it comes to my own team. Like, what can we, you know, I'm not for the bottleneck. Book, and I get mad when it takes too long for stuff to get approved. Like, why is this taking so long? This is, this thing, this is simple. And we need to reevaluate this process. So, yeah, no, I, the watchers are the ones that I, I'm always fascinated with their role because for one, they take it very seriously and they're paid handsomely to do the stuff that they do. And it's so mm -hmm. unnecessary. I experienced that working at BNL. I think government in general, there's just a lot of red tape for nothing. And so you had these people working in like the directorates who their sole purpose was to look at like, you know, a reload policy and see if like, you know, everything was itemized or somebody's receipt and pick it apart. And, you know, they'd be kicking it back three, four and five times. And this was acceptable. Meanwhile, things were being held up. And I'm like, who does this? And who is this person? And everybody's like, oh, don't, don't get involved. It's Mary so-and-so. She's been here for 35 yeah. years. She's a gentleman. Mary, she, little Miss Mary. She holds all it's the knowledge of the organization. And I'm like, screw that. Her job is pointless. I mean, like, I, mm -hmm. it's the futurist. <laughs> Sorry. I'm all, but again, a talent think is a workforce planning shop, right? So 
understand that I'm always looking at structures and looking, not necessarily looking to eliminate people, but I'm looking at structures to see what makes sense, right? I'm not yeah, and the technology pieces. People that right. are maybe fluff or, or not necessary to the efficiency of the run of the business. Yeah, because if organizations are finding, particularly when it comes to those sorts of things, a lot of that can be audited. And if your your financials are set up to analyze and flag things, like that's just, that's cold. You know, like I don't need a person for that. I can, you can scan a read and the scanner will know, oh, you ain't supposed to have that. And it'll, you know, flag and remove the thing is. So you got to be able to to add more value than just pushing the button and, and checking the box and saying no like the, you have to be you know that's the direction of the world of work um and then that that enters and within performance management you have to if you're managing people you have to be looking at their development and encouraging them to look beyond that but you have a lot of managers that are content to just have mary in cubicle seven she coming to work she on time she's doing her job you know, some people like her, some people don't, um, but that's not really a big deal. So, you know, we're going to give her three, she's going to get her, her cost of living, and we'll see Miss Mary next year. And that goes on and on and on, you know, instead of the manager saying, okay, Mary, what else you got besides no's and pushback? Um, you know, if you're doing, how many no's are you handing out as opposed to yeses, and what's wrong with the process? You train people to the better. So, so I still marry people. Breaking out. I'm not. I'm not on the eat up org. What do you mean, is though? Me on the eat up org. Oh my god! Pablo looks like he is um kind of crying. Oh, she's back. Never mind. Okay. All right. And there we are. All right. <laughs> he was straight praying. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, one of the things he said that I love, other than being the anarchist that he is, which I also love, was revolutionary thinking, evolutionary steps, right? So, he even he understands, like, mm -hmm. let's be revolutionary in our thinking, but ultimately, it's only ever been evolutionary you know like how we get mm -hmm. here you know which i think yeah if I, we, we here right now you know we want to be here but there's a whole path in the right. middle that that we have to progress through and somebody's got to be planning for that and I, that's far more realistic but i'm i don't think he's wrong in saying that we really you know we control people and we really we take we tell them to be innovative we tell them to be creative and then we take all the we suck all the creativity um and those spaces for them to be able to choose out the air and then we get surprised when they don't do that so we if we want if we if creativity and innovation is really what we want then you have to create space for that um and that requires allowing people to to work in a, in different ways and at a different pace and, and most organizations just aren't prepared for that it's true pablo um, I think that it's not only organizations. I think it's it's uh, it's the leadership that's not prepared for that as well. So um, I notice, like in a lot of the places that I've done contracts with, or that I've worked internships at, and so forth, um, the larger the organizations, the government, things of that nature, you know, everything is so everyone is so excited, as you said, like being a watcher or being in control. And you look at a lot of these startups. I mean the culture of the environment of these organizations and where these leaders are coming from also. So um, startup culture is super and wildly successful on the West Coast, more so than on the East Coast, because on the East Coast, just the culture, the old school mindset of a lot of things, you're not going to be able to um, sit down with somebody in New York and like handshake a deal off of a napkin thing like they're gonna hit their lawyer they have like three of them they got two friends they got like six different variations of their contract like it's gonna have to go down that way and it's one of the reasons that you you see like regionally like in the south um i've seen 
in a lot of, of relationship-based stuff. Whereas you would not do business with someone on the East Coast because they're just not performing. And a lot of times in Southern states, you're just kind of like, you know what? We've always done business. We're just going to give them that chance. It's, you, you, I think also understanding the leadership background helps in terms of like that trickle down effect as well. Um, just from what I've seen. Uh, so I think what you're saying um, that gentleman said would be really interesting to see um, as applied to different regions with different cultural approaches to business as well. Like whether it's familial, whether it's for efficiency and creativity, or whether it's for um, staying true to that organizational stuff as well. Yeah. I mean, I think he, I believe he did a lot of work here in the U.S., but he's been in Europe for some time. And, you know, Europe and, and even Asia for that matter, you know, very different ecosystems mm -hmm. when it comes mm -hmm. to business. Um, I realized, you know, going to Unleash last year, just being in that, that whole European kind of cohort, they're, they're fascinated just by how we manage you know, in the way that we work you know that they like eating you 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 stop and you eat you know you don't eat and work like what what is it with you guys in the u.s that mm -hmm. you've got to always be doing more than one thing at a time like they were so they're just so fascinated with how we manage because for the most part they find our way of living unhealthy you know every a lot of things are very compartmentalized over there unless you're dealing with a multinational company that is headquartered like say in the u.s and they just happen to have you know different shops over there then you get more of that u.s feel but if mm -hmm. you know if it's just just like a traditional shop and it's like in spain for instance like they just they don't get the go 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 they don't get the whole you know controlling and the whole hierarchy piece i mean they there's certainly structure to how they run their business but and it and it's far from loosey goosey it's just they're they're a little bit further ahead which i hadn't expected than we are in humanizing the whole process of it all they just are and it was you know like they they had a lot of questions like well why do you guys do this and why do you guys do that I'm like i i don't know we're derelicts we're horrible i don't know teach us your yeah. ways <laughs> like yeah. you know because i mean i it's true like I, I we should you should take lunch and you should walk and you should eat your lunch mm. and you should get away from your desk but like that's only if you're working in a place that's not placing those demands on you or if you actually have the balls to just say no i'm gonna do that so like for me by the time i got to bnl i had been abused so much that i was like i'm going outside every day nobody will ever make me sit at my test because i've done that shit and it's never been worth it so wonderful that you guys have these open fields and Zumba classes. I'm taking all the classes during my lunch and I don't care. And I did. I took Zumba. I took kickboxing. <laughs> I, was, I was doing it all because it was there, you know. Um, yeah. I, I refused, you know, but I, I had latitude to do that. As a lot of people who are working at levels that don't feel empowered to, you know, do that mm -hmm. onto themselves. They, they say, well my peer to my right, my peer to my left, they're always, they always seem to be at their desk eating. So I suppose I should do the same. You know, there's always that assimilation factor. We may have a certain way in which we'd prefer to work, but ultimately we always end up kind of bending to the curve um, of what we see happening in the workplace because the goal is to assimilate and not seem like an outlier, right? Because if you're an mm -hmm. outlier, then you're probably a troublemaker. And if you're a troublemaker, then that doesn't bode well for you. So it's interesting mm -hmm. what culture does to dissuade people from working in the best possible way for themselves. Um, okay, this is a question that I, that I think would be interesting to get Charles' opinion on in terms of how we seem to be moving to this like independent consulting freelance culture. How do you think that that looks in these environments where 
Um, this next generation, these Generation Z kids, like they're already doing contracts and stuff at like 17, 18. Like it's a different mindset, mm-hmm. right? What do you think that looks like for these organizations that are super used to control having to now manage and deal with all of these small independent consultants um, where they are getting ownership of how they work their schedules and things of that nature and maybe still producing? Uh, what do you think that that looks like moving forward? Turnover. I think that looks like turnover in the organization. <laughs> That's what I think it looks like. Cause I don't think this new generation and I've experienced that. Like they, there definitely is um, the younger end of the millennial spectrum, and then the this the generation that's coming after them, Gen Z, and I forget what the one is that's coming after them. They are very accustomed to like more freedoms um, and more independence in term, and they that's been encouraged, um, and they're they're getting because they have always they were birthed into technology and had the representations that you can, you know, create gigs for yourself from my 14 year old has, has gigs. He's 14. Mm -hmm. When he get when he gets to 18, 19, 20, you know, I'm assuming he's based on what he wants to do. He got to go to college. So, but when he gets into the regular workforce, that's going to look real different because in his mind, he's already been advocating for himself, negotiating for himself since he was a teenager. So he's not going to be like us who, you know, went to school, didn't think about these subjects. And then suddenly you get thrust into that in your early twenties. And it's like, Oh shit, what do I do? They're, they're already kind of seasoned at a lot of this stuff. So they, they're not going to be for the shit. And Mm -hmm. I think for organizations, if they don't, if they're leaders, if you still have, leaders of our generation who have not stayed current on what's going on in the younger generations and how to engage them and how to work product productively and successfully with them you're going to see turnover and you're going to see much more of you know this gig economy is going to continue to boom um i don't you know the pendulum always swings back but even when it swings back if you don't have leaders that are prepared to lead people in those those younger generations who have have worked differently their entire lives, organizations gonna be in trouble. They gonna have problems. I agree. I think it, it definitely looks like turnover. The other aspect of it is is I have found a lot of organizations still don't understand how you are supposed to manage ten ninety nine people. So, you know, foreseeably, if they're doing gigs like that, they're coming to you as a 1099 person, in which case, from a legal perspective, the ties you have to them are supposed to be as loose as possible. As possible, yeah. Um, there can be no signs whatsoever of you trying to control what they do, how they do it. They understand the parameters around the work you're expecting them to do or the project that they're assigned to. They executed the end. I've I've worked with employers that was trying to orientate 1099 people, have them come to train, all kinds of foolishness. Mm -hmm. Like literally when you're at 1099, they're giving them hours. Mm -hmm. Right. They're business onto themselves. Um, so I feel like it's it's interesting. The more that we get, you know, I guess the more that we get innovative and we we um, evolved, it's almost like you have to re-educate these leaders on like some of the the concepts of yesteryear, you know, to get them up to snuff. And and like again, going back to the work structures, like I just find way too many businesses don't understand like the people you have on your roster, how you're supposed to utilize them, full meaning Mm -hmm. FTEs, part-timers, temps, 1099, um, per diem. Per diem is one I'm seeing getting abused big, big, big time. Um, Particularly on the healthcare Mm -hmm. um, side, it's retarded. They've yeah, got and people. The Department believe, of Labor is auditing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they got people believing it's that they trouble. can have them per diem and that they've got to actually work like full time hours on a consistent basis. When I started working in healthcare, and you had a per diem, a per diem was there to fill in a gap. 
So we would hire a per diem, like if somebody went on maternity leave or somebody was on extended medical leave, or we just had like a project or an initiative that was going to go on for a while and we just needed some extra administrative help. Those are the reasons we hired a per diem. But the deal with them is you had to be really careful about how many hours you were giving them. So, you know, you, you had, it could be like five hours for the week, then it should have been needed to be like two hours. You're like you needed to be able to swap them out. So it never looked like too much of a consistent thing. Now I'm seeing these agencies hiring people per diem. They want them working like 40, 50 hours a week, mm -hmm. no benefits, none of the accoutrements that you're entitled to as an FTE, but they want all of the work that they would have a regular FTE do inclusive of holidays and all this other stuff and calling people on their days off and that sort of nonsense. Like it's a disaster waiting to happen. Um, and, but at the same token, people, you know, as much as we say people are empowered, they haven't caught up in, in realizing what their rights are either. So a lot of them are getting railroaded, mm -hmm. chasing a dollar and not realizing that they've got way more rights than they're currently exercising. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think in a lot of ways, you know, on both ends, there's a, there's an unpreparedness for what this gig economy is going to do. But yeah, I mean, to Sarah's point, it looks like a whole lot of turnover and it, and it looks like this, I know we hate to use it, but it looks like disruption, um, you know, be in, in the sense that businesses are going to have to fundamentally change the way that they're operating and the way they choose to work. Look, my, my personal bank, they just redid the bank. I went in there the other day and I've been saying that bank tellers were going to be one of the first to go. They just revamped the bank and go in there. There's no teller windows, none. It's all kiosks. You pick up a phone. If you need to talk to wow. somebody about how much, um, you know, when your check is going to go through, or when it might clear, you're talking to them in hop hog, which is like, you know, 20, 30 minutes from here, but there's no bodies in the, except for the people that are doing the big stuff like mortgages, money market accounts. There's still like a few people around to do that, but there's no tellers, none. It's done. Yeah. Well, you're seeing that in fast food as well because you're mm -hmm. finding that there's more and more kiosk ordering and the people, there's no, not customer service people, there's not a cashier. There's just people there who are preparing food and, and so forth. I, I know our Panera Bread nearby has like no cashiers, none. You walk in and either you've pre-ordered through the app and you just, you know, checking in to say, I'm here to pick my food up or you punching your little order in on the kiosk and you waiting until they call your number to pick your stuff up. So that's another one. And as we start, as technology advances, and particularly, you know, businesses are always looking for ways to be able to save a buck too, because part of that is, you know, is, is them w wanting to, you know, cut headcount, payroll and those sorts of things. And I'm not mad at it, but you know, but that's, that's real. So, yeah, but yeah, those sorts of positions. And so people are going to have to, employees are going to have to pivot in their mindset and employers are going to have to pivot in the way that they manage people because as we move into more traditional ways, what are you going to do with that, you know, young Gen Z person who you think is going to come in and work an hour shift behind a griddle and they like nope i'm out like you know because they're accustomed to that level of flexibility so everybody talks about wanting to be everybody want to be the next uber so it's time to be the next uber and to figure out how to effectively staff and achieve what it is that they achieve the level of flexibility that they offer in terms of scheduling that's not an easy thing to attain yeah. um so yeah. Yeah, it's all fun and games until it's time to do the thing. Any other Back thoughts, up. Pablo? Um, let's see. Hold on. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, I did have one other. So we're talking about, you know, gig economy and so forth. Um, and I know in the tech space, when it comes to this management, you get a lot, lot of sourcing as a result, right? So now you you get on Fiverr or something like that. And so you might have a lot of talent as a professional 
um, in the States, but you can't compete with the prices of, you know, the guy who's over in India, who's on Fiverr also doing similar work, but the money is stretching for it. So in this like management of these next gen kids who are like, you know, we're focused on doing our own thing and being super flexible, you start seeing co companies again, looking to outsource and, and put money down. How do uh, everyday employees prepare for that kind of stuff? So how do I back myself um, and prepare for potential additional outsourcing? Because now these big companies are going to be in a mindset that's looking right for freelancers. So say they get their policies together, then what? Like, how do I defend myself against the shift right back to outsourcing just in a different, you know, a different flavor of it? Multiple streams of income. Like, yeah. I think we, if, I, if we have learned nothing in in recent years, it should be that you cannot just have a single hustle. You have got to have be have be multifaceted in the skills that you offer and in the ways that you're able to produce income for you, legal income for yourself. <laughs> Um, so the way around that like for the individual, <laughs> I had to add that in there because, you know, listen, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's really about looking at how you can add skills to your repertoire that you can fall back on when, when that bubble bursts, um, because outsourcing is real. So is downturns in the economy. So is a crazy ass president who will shut the government down over a wall. So all of that is real. And when you don't have another mechanism, if you haven't gone back to Our Lady in Cubicle 7, like when, when all you know is how to stamp, stamp the paper and say no, and you don't have anything else that you've cultivated, you're going to be in, in a tough situation when robots take your job or you know, some or the little guy on Fiverr in <clears throat> India can can do the thing. Um, you know, those are real. Those are real, real concerns. But the way that you come back at as an individual is you diversify your skill set, um, and you 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 figure out what your additional hustles are. Everybody, you know, what do they say? You should have at least eight different streams of income. I think it's nine. So now. everybody is it not? See, look, it keeps going up. It's about to be. 47 before yeah. too long, but you got... Man, see, that's why you got to yeah. go to Europe. Europe, you have one or two and you can chill. <laughs> but, you know, the way that things are going, you have yeah. one or two, and those two end up being disrupted in the market, then you're out. Like, well, you know, I think yeah. part of it is, I mean, it's definitely the streams of income for sure. That's, if you're not looking at, the many different ways you can bring a buck in, then you're doing yourself a disservice. But I think what is going to happen is this democratization of work, right? Because for like a lot of years, we've put, it, it's to that whole Jeffrey Owens thing that went down, right? We've kind of put certain work on a pedestal and other work is has been like, you know, beneath us, depending on where you sit in society, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you have disruption of several markets or you have mass disruption just across the board economically, people going to really have to humble themselves and take what is available. Right. Mm -hmm. So even for me, like I love my business, I'm, I'm up to about, you know, my eighth or ninth stream of income. But that being said, if anything substantial gets disrupted, look, I'll go do Instacart I'll go work at Target okay. and pop and fold. Okay. Like, as long as I'm keeping my head above water until the next bubble comes and then I'll jump on that if it's reasonable and, you know, make money doing that. But I think people are have to get away from this mindset that certain work is above other work. It's all just work. And truthfully, at the end of the day, if none of us had to get up every day and shuck and jive, we'd be doing very different things. Like, my ass would be on the beach like a good Buddha, writing and meditating every day. Mm. That's it. Quite happily, to be quite frank. I, it yeah. doesn't mean that I don't love what I do. I absolutely do. 
but what would I rather do if I didn't have to worry about financial aspects and a roof over my head and how my kids are going to eat? Yeah. If I just have money in the bank and shit working for me in the stock market, I would open myself a bed and breakfast and be chill. Y'all would never even know. I'd be off the radar. I wouldn't even be on social media for that matter. Like that's the, end, you know, like, so I think more of us just have to get real about, you know, the end game. Yeah. You know, and 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 what it is we're really wanting for ourselves and get away and stop shaming work you know like you do what mm-hmm. you have to do to keep your head above water even with the shutdown it's like it was unfortunate i've certainly been there but i'm not about to lose my house over no dumbass president i don't know so mm-hmm. you know there's nothing during that time that's barring you from going out there and getting work other than perhaps if you've got caregiving duties that would prevent you from being able to you know take some of those jobs which is hard for some mothers but shit i'll go to applebee's if i had to you know what i mean some money's better than nothing but it's this, this haughtiness you know that we have particularly here in the u.s around work it's the same reason why we have people coming from all sorts of other countries and they do that sort of work hands down they don't care because in their minds they already have the the line of sight in mind for what they're trying to do they don't care how they get there they're just going to do the work you know but then like we turn around and we complain about why they're here but (laughs) we do have a haughtiness around work that we need to get over if we're to I think thrive in in this the, this next decade, next two decades, if you will. Oh, okay. <laughs> the agrees. doctor's like, oh, all right, he agrees. I yeah, thought you were know, to here, 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 here. tonight. Makes sense. Makes sense. Look, I told you I'm staying in my lane. I'm learning tonight. Like I watched uh, the, the show earlier a little bit, and there, I'm just learning, just taking it in, and um, yeah, it's really interesting you mentioned like the you know downturns and and shakeups and so forth because you know i was talking to someone about like just the current economy is like there's going to be a little crash for the end of the year and so you're seeing a lot of those who have money in the stocks who are doing beach work they're kind of like cashing out so that they can take the most advantage of buying things when they're low and i don't think that as you said like enough of like the working class and those of us who are like at that lower level financially, you know, socioeconomic levels are really paying attention to these trends to be able to capitalize on it, even if it's in a small way, you know, um, we, I think we, a lot of, like you said, like a lot of we just kind of clocking in, clocking out and looking, seeing jobs as more stable than they are in 2019. That's the thing right. that I see. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's really not having a job is still kind of similar in terms of danger to having your own business a little more secure, a little more stable, but financially, but it's, anything can happen at a moment, you know? Mm-hmm. Particularly so if you're in an at-will state. <laughs> yeah, Tennessee, we out here. So. <laughs> Tennessee, we out here. Let's yeah. go. New York too, like at people, yep. I, I wish the day people get that through their thick heads, the better, like, but really, can they fire me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But, really, can they, yes. But, but I did da-da, this, this, and this. They can fire you. They can fire you too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Unless so you come from get nothing else from this show. That is around Title Seven violations or human rights, then we have something that we can, and even then, they can still fire you. We got to deal with it on the back end. We trying to mm-hmm. help you mm-hmm. out here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the word on these streets. That's what we so know. You can be low. Yeah. The, the, the ending thought know your rights, people. Know your rights. <laughs> yeah. Really, it's 2019. Take a gander at Department of Labor, your Department of Human Rights, EEOC. Like, get to know these things because it's like, Mm -hmm. it's. I'll tell you one state that, yeah, the one state I know that gets that right is California. Yeah, some workers in California know they right. They will be like, oh no, because Section 14.2 subset zero. 
says that you got to the, yeah, they will quote the code to you. Shout out to people in California. I don't know what y'all doing to educate your workers, but they know the code. They do, and they will get you together when you don't do something it is that it's you're supposed so to do related to their rights. And I don't see that happening like that no place else. People in California, that's why HR people hate California, because they will call you up. Yeah. And be like, let me tell you um, that why this is not authorized and why you're going to have to cut my check to the day. Because <laughs> such a B. It's so such true. That B says, or otherwise, you're going to be paying this waiting penalty. And sometimes they'll let you hang yourself. And they'll be like, I'm going to need this coin and I'm going to need this wait penalty. Oh, the people <laughs> in California be no win, no win. And no. I, but I re- you got to respect everybody it. brought that energy, both employees and managers to just know they right. I think a lot of the foolishness would dissipate. Yeah. Cause now, you know, there's, it's not aim no more. Now everybody is on the same knowledge level and you gotta, you know, there's no room to take advantage of people. So yeah. Shout out to California. Hey, as a, as a person, I feel like you guys should put together something so I could have like a quick guide so I could come out here and come at all these other HR people. <laughs> and we'll go, we'll go that out there for the initiative. Word. That, would be, no. that would be a wonderful downloadable. It would be give away. Give away. Yeah, I would. About. I would give up my email address for that. Interesting. <laughs> you subscribe. I would you give it. Give it up a good. Yeah, like a, a ninety-nine cents app idea right here. We might make bank on right that right there tonight. Okay tonight maybe, we, done, maybe. we done come up with a stream of income right? <laughs> Look at it. income right then no it, right it, then. it's so true i swear to you i was i was getting abused for like eight years and i and i just incrementally came to finding out like the ways in which i was being abused and then it was yeah. like the statute mm-hmm. of limitations were up I, I wised up on like year six and took some folks to task yeah. so yeah it's important pretty darn important I, mean, I don't i don't know what i'm saying i'm just saying it sounds kind of cool you know if i could come in and have documentation ready or know which link i need to go to my state bring that fire in the bag when we have these discussions it's like, ah. i'm I, I will put this shameless plug out here i am i am known as the uh the ter- the, the pre-termination whisperer I've gotten a few people their jobs back securely. I mean, high people by writing yeah. some pretty firm letters that they were able to slide over to their superiors okay. that scared their, their not only them but their lawyers. Wow. Um, yeah. So what you're saying is there's a secret service you ain't been promoting. Word. That you could uh, put out there for it's top dollars. It's for executives. I feel no, like but this, I, this but is I, a clip. I, I this is no a this is an Instagram nugget clip right here. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Word. Word. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> Keep your job. I thought you was going to be fired. Word. Well, What's you know, your job? You know, they, 10% you know, of your salary? Starbucks <laughs> has like a secret menu. You know, talent yeah. thing has a secret menu. That's yeah, one of I'm my with, secret menu it. items. So. See, y'all are welcome. I'm unlocking the cheat codes for y'all. Y'all don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> level up, level up. Exactly. Stumbled <laughs> into like a little yes. magical cavern. I didn't know this was a thing. This was not dramatized. This was real life. Oh, Lord. oh my God. Well, what do you guys got going on before we wrap it up? Black Lives Matter is still going strong. Black History Month be over, but we still have the whole month of March with new content. Um, the, the microblog challenge is over. I successfully did the 28 days of posting. I'm exhausted. I don't ever want to make another meme. I mean, I'm not going to see no memes out of me for a good while. But yes, the microblog challenge is done. But the writing challenge is still going. So keep keep checking hashtag Black Lives Matter, and then I'll be at Work Human in Nashville with the doctor. Let's go! About, I got my camera. Let's go. I got my camera. About, Give me my press credentials. And, I got you. It's about to be us and Viola Davis. Yes. In, in Nashville in about two weeks, so that's gonna I'm be with, awesome. With it, with it, I'm ready. Um, what am I working on right now? 
I did a webinar last week. Uh, yeah, this Tuesday? No, this week, Tuesday, same week. So I did a webinar Tuesday and, um, and it, was, it was really cool. So right now um, we're just kind of following up and giving like discounts on email marketing services and cybersecurity planning uh, for the next week. And um, also doing a 31 or what was it 20 days of videos, like basically trying to put out a video every day in the month of March. So launching that tomorrow for uh, cybersecurity facts on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook. How long are these videos gonna be? Like three to five minutes. Ooh, bless your life. Maybe less. It, we're just going through. We're right now to cover the topics. Um, I, I covered a lot of different things in the webinar. Talked a little bit about making data-driven marketing plans um, and cyber plan, integrating those together for small businesses to be able to make money. And so there were some follow-up conversations that I had that made it apparent that I needed to kind of maybe break on some more of the topics that I introduced. And so we're going to break those out and do like a, try to do a video every business day. So we're going to try to make that hot. This I know that I know that life all too well. And yeah. um, so does, so does, so does Chime. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we, I wish you nothing but success. Absolutely. With that. Thank you. I, I wish, I wish me nothing but success also, cause it's going to be rough. I'm going to tell you, <laughs> I'm going to tell you around, around day, day 17. Your word. About day 17. That shit gets real. It gets so real. <laughs> it's suffrage <laughs> at that point. You just like, it's day I 17. Never, <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, we I out never, here. Like, oh, uh, like, I have, a, I have some stuff together. I kind of have like a little content calendar and a list, but um, you know, it's gonna be it's gonna be a thing, definitely. You're gonna be good. You Do have a hashtag so we can make sure I'm I'm watching and sharing because you've done. You know what? That's a great idea. I'm gonna stuff. put a hashtag together. I really didn't have one other than uh, um, you know, MB usable security. I was gonna put like MB sec or something like that, but. We go. Maybe maybe I'll come with a hashtag by tomorrow. Your buddy, she's the hashtag queen. She she's a you hashtag. Yeah, I'm a, I'll help you out. I'll help I you out. You. I appreciate you. I got you. I'm I'm gonna shoot you a message on the gram. I got okay. you. Okay. I appreciate you. I'm with it. I'm with it. Yeah. So on my end, I am getting ready to speak for Sherm Long Island on Monday. I am I see you out here. Yes, um, myself like and uh, Steve Levy <laughs> are doing a whole diversity, inclusion, and equity panel for um, Sherm Long Island. So that's Monday. So I'm in preparation for that. Is that going to be on your IG live like the last one was? I'm hoping that they'll let me do it. Yeah. You know, I, I you know how some of these chapters are, but I'm hoping to get at least some video or let me do like a pivot to the panel <laughs> if nobody else. So yeah, I am aiming to do that. I'm, I think I might do like an IG live just to just switch it up. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. that's yeah. Yeah. happening Monday. Oh, yeah. and I'd be lying if I said that I, um, I'm focused on anything but my trip to Spain, to be honest. That's, that's it. <laughs> I'm so we doing, so doing the after show. We doing the after show while you in Spain. I, no feel shows. Like, I mean, if you guys want to, I feel like you're welcome to. You know, you could put like a a dummy doll or something, a Zarina doll. We just gonna have a little face. Uh, <laughs> so we can do the show. You not? Wait, she said, I I know. I, I noticed. I was if y'all want, if y'all want to do the show, okay. I don't know. We'll discuss, <laughs> but. I'm six hours ahead of you guys, so this presents a, a challenge. It's early um, morning. You'll be all right. You should just be getting in from the club. And looking like what? Like you just got fabulous. in from the club. Looking like fabulous. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll talk about this offline. I got y'all to talk about this. Thank you for being with us. We'll be back next week with a new topic. <laughs> Bye. Bye.